Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Use promo code TWIST and get a free month of New Relic Pro. To redeem, visit newrelic.com forward slash thisweekend and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by SourceBits. Visit sourcebits.com to begin your mobile app development journey. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups. It's been a big week of news. We've got YouTube launching subscriptions and the tragic death of Jody Sherman from Ecomom. We're going to talk about all these issues and more uh, today on This Week in Startups. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't going to live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't good. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. It's episode number 326. You know, it's one of these days it's going to wind up being like episode 500, then it'll wind up being 1,000. Like, that means well, you got to keep doing it. I know, I know. I don't know. I'm still like, a, I think this is the last year. I think it's the last year. You know the fans want more. I know. I just, you know, it's exhausting. The show is so exhausting. Uh, but then every time after the, after the episode and after I get the feedback, then I'm like, I ride a high on it. You know, it's like, it's like I'm very, I don't want to say bipolar on it because we got some, you know, uh, tough topics, but maybe it's actually a good segue. We're going to talk today, obviously, about the death of Jody Sherman of Ecomom, the suicide. Um, and just that sort of the nature of being a founder. Um, and we have uh, Gina Bianchini is going to be on the program, which if you're wondering how, it's not Bianchini, which is sort of how it looks like it's spelled. It's Bianchini, which is like uh, zucchini. There you go. There you go. Uh, and um, Marshall Kirkpatrick uh, is with us, so we'll have them on in just a second. But uh, before we do, let me just let people know that this Friday, like why, so why am I telling people about this Friday, or next Friday, if it's sold out? Well, we are still like, accepting people on the wait list, and we're uh, hoping there's got to be a lot of people on the wait list. 34? 34 people on the wait list, and how many tickets did we? 200. That space can only fit 150. Well, well, we will have to ask people if they're still able to come, and then we can let those. Oh, I see. Because you always get that last minute stuff exactly. in the other one. Okay, all right, that's fair enough. Okay, listen, uh, this is becoming very successful. Uh, this live uh, this week in startups, and the next one is on uh, Friday, February eighth, and it's going to be Dave McClure, which is just going to be him cursing and making rap references and being a potty mouth. Um, I don't know if we have a swear jar big enough for Dave. No, that's going to be the bit. I want you to bring the regular swear jar and put that up, <laughs> and then I want you to have like a giant mason jar, and then put in put the Dave McClure size <laughs> and then I'm going to put his credit card in it. That'd be like a funny bit. We'll All just right. pull it out. Like we'll Let's do a do little that. bit. See, that's what I need is a comedy writer for the show. Uh, but anyway, this will be great. Go to twist live number three dot eventbrite com and you'll uh, get to um, uh, sign up for the wait list. Sorry. Uh, hey, why don't we put like a, why don't we make some money off this? Why don't we put like 10 tickets up for like 500 bucks a piece? See if we can make some money. You think people would pay that much? Sure. Why not? If they want to support the show, not just come to see Dave. Would well, they get like guaranteed front row you know, seats? The problem or? is, I've been telling everybody the show makes like a half million dollars a year, and so now it's like if I ask for money, then it's gonna be like I'm being greedy. Well, we, maybe we give. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we sell ten tickets for five hundred dollars a piece, and we'll give it to charity? Okay. If anybody wants to be a mensch, and, uh, and if they do buy the tickets, yeah, that's it. Put, uh, use Eventbrite to make ten tickets for five hundred dollars each. We'll go towards a scholarship uh, for a disadvantaged kid in uh, Brooklyn, my hometown, at Bay Ridge Prep. We'll put it towards like a scholarship. That'd okay. be a cool thing to do, right? And then sure. I'll read the names of the people who paid the $500. Right, donations. and you'll give them a special seat in the front? Yeah, front row seat. That's it. Okay. Good idea, Karen. Nice punch up. Yep. Nice punch up. Sure. Good punch up. I like it. Okay, hey, um, so there you go. Uh, if you want a guaranteed seat, 500 bucks, you donate to Bay Ridge Prep, and uh, it's a school I'm on the board of in Brooklyn that does really great stuff with for challenged kids um, in my hometown of Brooklyn. And uh, at the end of the program, SourceBits is going to show us the latest update to the crowdfunding app for the launch festival, which will be fantastic. And New Relic, New Relic, uh, boy, New Relic has really saved the day for us. They do real user experience monitoring, code level app performance, and server resources. We use it for the launch ticker and for this weekend. And it lets me know, hey, who do I yell and scream at when something's not working right? Is it the network? Is it the web application? Should I be calling 
you know, the people who provide the bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. Speed is critical when you're launching these web applications and having an affordable, reliable solution like New Relic is critical. And it just works so great because I get all these emails and stuff like that. See, this is the monitor email I get. Let me just check right now this week, 100% uptime, good. But the page load, not so good. We have to make the thing, we're going to rewrite the launch ticker. That's the launch ticker. It's just too slow because of my stupid idea to do the live well, You typing. thought it was pretty brilliant like six months ago. Yeah, so that's the thing about being an entrepreneur. You think you have like some brilliant idea and it turns out your idea is not that brilliant. Even your idea is not always brilliant. Most of my ideas are not brilliant. You know what my career is? This is what I've determined at this point in my <laughs> career is. My career is I've tried so much <laughs> I've tried so much <laughs> I, I, $20, man, 20 20 is going in. But that's the thing. I've tried so much sugar and relentlessly, then you know what? Once in a while, something hits, and then you look like a genius. That's it. That's the nature of entrepreneurship. Anybody who thinks that you bat a thousand percent, I mean, Steve Jobs made the goddamn Newton. I mean, that thing was terrible. And the Cube, I mean, he made a lot of bad stuff. But New Relic. And next. But New Relic. Oh, right. Thank you. Back to the commercial. <laughs> new Relic. Customers. Skull Candy. Spotify. Nike. Zillow. Vonage. And they let me know when I have a bad idea. And then the, the bad idea was I wanted to have that live editing. And, you know, it just makes it too slow. And that's what I'm getting all these complaints. It's too slow. It's too slow. I try to log in. It's too slow. And I'm okay. I hear everybody. It, I get it. Thank you, New Relic. And it takes a while to download the earlier posts if you just want to. It does. Scroll. It's too slow. So we got to fix that. And mm -hmm. thank you, New Relic, for helping. NewRelic.com slash this weekend to get one of these free t shirts. Oh, I finally got mine. You finally got one, yeah. Oh, about time. Look at that. New Relic plus twist. Thank you. That's a very nice shirt. With and the uh, samurai sword, as I always say, be a samurai, not a rice baker. Exactly. <sighs> Fast, easy, no credit card required. Thank you so much, New Relic. Hey, welcome to the program, Marsha Kirkpatrick. Welcome back, I should say. How are you doing? Well. You're good. And the, the beard... Yeah, life's good. The beard is out of control. A sure sign that you're working hard on your uh, startup. How is little, <laughs> how's Little Bird going? It's going really great. We're, uh, we're making a bunch of things happen. People are coming in, testing it out every day, and we're getting great back. So uh, we're, we're living the, the star dream. This is such a great product. I hate, are you, weren't you going to give me like a, a free account or something like that? Don't I get a free account or something? It's really, what's the pricing on this? Because, you know, it's really powerful. You can go in there and you can like oh, yeah. see all the people who mm -hmm. are like in your vertical and exactly. then bond with them. But I think you're making it expensive so that people only like uh, a certain group of people have it, right? Is that the philosophy? Well, it's a, a B2B uh, service for sure. Um, if I felt like millions of people uh, would be able to to use it and get value out of it, or tens, hundreds of millions, uh, then uh, then we might price it differently. But it's really something for for really ambitious, smart uh, people that want to jump in and win at their respective fields. Um, so we're we're selling it accordingly. What does it cost per month? What's the pricing start at? Uh, it depends on the size of the company. Uh, Say a startup yeah, company, fifty person company, something like that. It, uh, it starts at $250 a month. Oh, okay. Well, that's not so bad for what you get. And the the idea was I would use Little Bird to um, find the to find socially influential people in my vertical. Yep. Or uh, any vertical you're interested in engaging with. Uh, we can help you find out uh, who the top people are you're already connected to so you can reach out to them and leverage your own community, search inside their archives of content. Uh, find hot news to to engage with and share and add value to and build social capital. Well, that's awesome. Uh, congratulations on the success of it. Uh, Gina Bianchini is here. Did I get it right? Bianchini? You did. Bianchini. You did. God, I hate when people mispronounce my name. I was on a call today and people were saying Kalakinus and I was like, how the hell did you get Kalakinus? Uh, how are you doing, Gina? Long time no I'm talk. great. Yeah. And how's, er how's everything at Mighty Bell? Mighty Bell is rocking and rolling. We're about six weeks away from launching some new stuff that I'm pretty excited about. So. Oh, awesome. Oh, Perfect timing for the launch festival. I was just going to say, I didn't it, know that. Except I'm not, I'm out of town. Oh, <sighs> see, I know the Allen and Company thing is going on at the same time. They Dang. booked it at the same, I, I can't tell, I can't say that Gene is going to the <laughs> Allen and Company thing, but I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. <gasps> Maybe you go one day late, you show up Monday night, come Monday. All right. Anyway, uh, and Mighty Bell, uh, some new stuff coming out. Great. Can't wait. Everybody uh, go check that out. Hey, let's start the news. All right. Well, you said you wanted to talk about Jody Sherman first. Yeah, we got to get that out of the way. All right. So a real bummer. Jody uh, was found dead on Monday, a victim of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. 
He was one of the leaders of the Silicon Beach movement here in L.A. Um, he relocated his startup Ecomom, which is just selling great family products, very safe products, um, to Las Vegas. Um, lots of people have come out with great pieces about how great Jody was. Um, Sarah Lacey, uh, you, as well as uh, Mark Suster. Mark Suster wrote a great piece. Exactly. So um, I guess, you know, the question is, what can, what, can, what can be done to help with the stresses of being a founder? Well, I'm obviously, you know, I'm, Jordy was on the show. Yep. I, you know, I looked back and I did a search for like emails. Like, I, you know, it's like, it's all very new to all of us when something like this happens. I've never actually known somebody who committed suicide. So this is like a first for me. I'm 42 years old. I guess I'm very lucky. I, I knew Aaron as well, Aaron Schwartz, uh, who tragically killed himself. But I didn't really know him. Like he wasn't ever on the show. I didn't ever have dinner with him. But I did a search. I had like a hundred emails back and forth with Jody. And like, I realized like we were friends. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think we were like, I wasn't a close friend of his, but I was a friend. And, you know, it, I, I'm kind of disturbed by the whole thing. And we don't know. And then it's like, do you talk about it or not? So Sarah Lacey and I had this whole discussion, like, and I wrote a piece about it. And I was like, I don't really want to publish the piece because I don't well, we did. know if I have a place in this conversation or if we are actually seeing a trend or not. Like Sarah said, I don't want to think about the trend. I just want to think about the person, which I respect. And I told her I respected that. But then I did want to talk about, is there a trend here? Because we have three of them, Ilya, who was one of the co-founders of Diaspora, Aaron and Jody. And I, I don't know all of those folks well enough to look for a trend. And then nobody was talking about the fact that it was suicide, even though you know, I was talking, I had like 10 people email me what happened. I said, I don't know what happened. This is what I told people privately. I don't know what happened. But the fact that we don't know what happened, when a young person dies suddenly and you don't immediately know, it, it usually goes somewhere dark, like a drug overdose or a suicide or just something. Or it could people, have just been a horrible, like drunk driving accident or something. Well, if that happened, then you would know, right? right? And Because then they would say he would die in an accident. But in this case, you don't know. And it, it, the whole thing is just very sad. And I started doing some research on this and I... I it's kind of like depressing even to research it because I do wonder now that I've been an angel investor and I've worked closely with a do couple of dozen young entrepreneurs, it is very stressful. And does the amount of entrepreneurship going on plus, you know, a wider group of people plus mental illness equal, you know, that we might see more suicides, right? Or is there something in our community that people are so driven that if they feel like if they're failure compared to, Facebook or Twitter that, you know, they, somebody who There's maybe so is or, shame. Yeah. Like statement. maybe. And, and then I started looking at the statistics. It's like, you know, suicide is a male thing mainly. It's like twice as many men. And it's the number one, I think it's the number 10, 10th cause of death, low percentage point, but still it's the 10th. And so it, well, it just seems so unavoidable. And then a good friend of mine, Mark Pesci was like, you know, you, the reason you're disturbed by this, and I, I, I have to admit, I am disturbed by it is because you look at it as something that could have been avoided. And in some cases, he said, suicide is a disease that somebody has, and it's just going to play itself out. I don't actually want to believe that, but maybe he's right. I don't know. Gina, when you look at this, I mean, what do you think? I mean, you've been such a, you've been a serial entrepreneur. You've had ups and downs. How do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tragic situation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think so many of us saw Jody, you know, in October at the lobby and, he was full of life and himself and just a total character. Um, and, and I didn't know him super well, but, but certainly knew him and knew of him and had a tremendous amount of respect for him as well. You know, I think this life is hard. Um, you know, it's, it, no one should feel sorry for startup founders or startup CEOs or whatever you want to call it. And at the same point in time, I think one of, I, I saw somebody write this and I thought it was really thoughtful, which was one of the most I think insidious pieces of the startup culture is the fact that everybody has to be killing it all the time yeah. when, as we know, you know, a lot of the way these services get built is crickets, crickets, crickets. Oh, we really have done something wrong. Oh, shit, this is great. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it's a game of inches in terms of making improvements and, and, what this all is. And so you can go from something being very dark to very wonderful, or it just stays dark. I mean, one of, one of my favorite expressions um, that a friend of mine uses is it's darkest right before it goes, you know, pitch black. Um, and 
it's just hard to tell. And yet we have this culture that celebrates success and mythologizes success that you actually, I think it makes all of it a lot lonelier at times. Yeah, that's very well said, you know. I mean, it's, well, Marsha, what's your take? Oh, I, I was unfamiliar with Jody uh, in particular, and I, I hesitate to, to extrapolate uh, much into the general situation. But, you know, life is hard, and everybody deserves more empathy and, and help and care than, uh, than most of us, uh, most of the people in the world get. So, yeah. So. I, I, life is hard. Life is complicated, and nobody I do, wants to look weak. I think there is that, you know, and I, and I think, you know, yeah, it, it's very hard to show weakness. And I, I've had this conversation because if you're the CEO or founder of a company, you have a team of employees, and if you show weakness to them, they might get rattled and want to leave the company and go somewhere they feel is more stable or growing, right? And then you have your board, and your board might start to feel like, oh, um, you know, you, you, can you go to your board and say, hey, board of directors, I, I feel pretty weak and vulnerable at this time. I feel like this is all going to come apart. And you're sort of stuck, right? You're trapped as a founder. And it's, it, it doesn't need to be that way because I think Brad Feld and some other folks have chimed in like, hey, it's okay. And you're a better leader if you're vulnerable. And I think... You know, I, I think I've been more, I've tried to be more and more honest with my teams about where we're actually at and how things are going and what the, you know, concerns I have are. But, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I don't get suicide because I, I'm just not wired that way, I guess. I'm like, I look at this, all the suicide, I just think to myself, like, my God, there's so many safety outlets. Like, you could go join an ashram and just go do yoga for a year and take a year off and just enjoy life. And, but I guess for some people, it's not, they don't see it that way. They don't see that possibility. And so it's overall, I'm just super bummed out about it. And God, if anybody who's a friend of mine or even not a friend of mine is thinking of doing something like this, for the love of God, like these startups are not as important. Not, I mean, I made startups my life, founding companies my life. I can tell you it is not as important as life itself. Life is wonderful and beautiful, and it's not as bad as you think it is, if you actually think it's that bad. And the thing that matters most is how you conduct yourself in pursuit of your dreams, not if you hit them or not. It's the journey. And, and I know that sounds super corny, but I can tell you every person I know who's successful has had very dark moments, very, you know, you read the biography of Steve Jobs, you know, read any biography of somebody who's done something great or just talk to people who've done something great and they'll tell you there's been many times when it looked like they were gonna be complete failures. Failure success is, there's a lot of randomness to it, but really it's how you conduct yourself and, you know, I don't know if I can say anything more about it. So if somebody who's listening right now is feeling like they're in a really dark place, should they Call do? one of those suicide hotlines, number one, mm -hmm. and number two, go talk to your friends who are founders and tell them how they're feeling like we just had an ask Jason about this right. the other week and I was like this person was like sort of feeling isolated and alone I said that's typical you will feel isolated and alone you need to go get four or five people you trust have dinner with them and talk about what are the worst horrible things going on and like Jean and I have gone and had coffee before she's had ups and downs in her career right? I mean and it's really like your career is not measured in just one project or one week it's the whole entity of your career you know I don't know is there anything more to say about it, Gina? I don't know if you have anything else to say. I don't think so. Yeah, it's the whole situation. And, and just my heart goes out to his uh, wife and family and, you know, the people who loved him. And it's certainly, certainly going to be missed. So let's go to the next story. All right. You want to talk about YouTube's paid sure. subscriptions. Yep. So uh, first round of paid channels reportedly will cost somewhere between a dollar and five dollars per month. Which channels will be the first to offer the paid subscription is unknown, but sources are expecting companies like Machinima, Maker Studios, and other media companies that have been successful in building subscribers. Yep. Uh, channels will also have the option to play ads on their paid channels. So, you know, how will this change the quality of the videos that we're seeing? And will subscribers actually pay? This is a big trend. I mean, uh, Gina, you were very much getting people to pay for Ning, and uh, I assume Mighty Bell will have a paid option. I don't know if it does already, but what are your thoughts on people subscribing and paying in YouTube? Do you think that's going to be a, an actual trend? 
I mean, I think that it has a lot of potential. Um, I think the big thing to to pay attention to is what kinds of people and or verticals pay. Um, I don't necessarily, as I was reading this, I was like, I don't really see gamers and people who just love YouTube videos paying as much as when you look at politics, especially extreme politics and, and, um, and faith as well, being two areas that actually probably have the highest probability of paid subscription success. So it'll be really interesting to see you know, which categories start off with uh, premium subscriptions and then what those price points are going to be and then also you know, how it evolves over time, obviously. But I, I think when you look at things like the Glenn Beck experiment, um, you know, this is not necessarily 18-year-old guys paying for Mishimina content. Um, it's much more about premium content on the extremes. Yeah, I think it's very insightful. Um, one of the biggest growing categories is education on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously my company is involved with YouTube. We're one of the funded partners. So I've known about this uh, discussion going on and we'll obviously try it with This Week in Startups, I think for the archive at some point. And um, I, I'm wondering where iTunes is in all this. Like why can't you pay to subscribe to a podcast? You can pay to buy everything else on iTunes. Exactly. So Apple really needs to get that going. And it will make things sustainable. Um, obviously this show has uh, you know, donations, Leo has donations. And I think what you'll see is the top 5% of, one to 5% of people who have large subscription bases. And politics is interesting. I immediately thought of the Young Turks, um, uh, Jank, who runs that. He's got 573,000 subscribers. I mean, if he gets 1%, 5,000 people to pay $5 a month, you know, hey, that's now $300,000 a year. Not that, bad. That's meaningful production because he's yeah. probably got a five-person, six-person team. That could mean he could add 50% more people to his team. Right. Very significant money. And um, more and people might come onto YouTube if they know they can charge for their content. Absolutely. Like, like, yeah. Know, existing stars. I, I think there's a bit of a debate inside of YouTube as to if this is the right way to go or not. But the way I look at it is why not? I mean... It's not going to be mandatory. No. Marshall, what are your thoughts? Well, Vimeo has been doing this for independent films now since November. Um, and, and I can imagine that's a place where, where people would pay for, uh, for high quality independent film. But um, big, I, I wonder how the, the overhead and the potential revenue works. Uh, for, for content producers when the, the price is $5 or less per month. Um, I mean, that, that was part of the coverage. And does that mean uh, that, it, that it only works out for people with real low overhead? Or uh, is this something that is going to be a big win for, for professional content producers and big media brands? I know uh, every time YouTube does anything, uh, people complain that it's a, a further a move further away from its user generated content roots. And yeah. I I wonder if this uh, that's really an astute point. That. You know, I I think that this helps the smaller folks. I th I think this is going to be such a small amount of money. I don't see, you know, Disney and Sesame Street necessarily embracing this. They should, but I don't see them embracing it immediately. But can you imagine if Disney Princess had a five dollar a month subscription? Because my daughter loves going on there. You'd and, pay for it. Well, of course I would pay for it, yeah. And um, I, I would let my daughter borrow my password once in a while so she could watch Disney Princess as well. <laughs> she made a Jason's Disney... secret obsession. God, I am... I, the fact that I know who, you know, each of, you know, Tiana and Ariel, I mean, I know the backstories. <laughs> Who's now. your favorite? I think at this point I'm very big on Pocahontas. Oh, really? I'm I wouldn't very have big that. on po Well, it's because I like the whole, you know, the whole backstory of, like, you know, what's around the river bend, and it's, it's like okay. a superior narrative to it, I think, than some of the other <laughs> princesses, like waiting for their prince to come, as yep. opposed to like, I'm gonna go out and find out what's around right. the river bend. But anyway, I, um, what, what people don't realize is, even at $5, the programs are so cheap to make. So when we started this program, it was just me and Tyler, like in two microphones, we just hit record, the quests were pretty low, like, you know, $500 an episode or something. And you know, it's gotten more expensive as we increase production value. But if you get a thousand people to pay five dollars a month, that could be enough for somebody to start a show. It's enough for one or two people to have spending money to do it. So it will make things uh, just like Kickstarter. You know, has everybody underestimated Kickstarter's impact? And I think this could be Kickstarter-like in its approach. Interesting. So what kind the of the other thing that I would 
I would throw in there is it seems like one of the missed opportunities is to bundle and to actually create bundles of um, of programming just like the cable companies have done for very successfully um, and it's just interesting to me that that I would think you'd want to start with bundled experiments to then move to a la carte as opposed to starting with a la carte and then trying to move to bundles. Yeah, that's a very astute point. It's interesting. We're watching everybody try to unbundle cable so people can buy a la carte. But here, it does make sense that like the Young Turks and five other political folks could make a, you know, a $5 a month subscription. Like a humble bundle. Like a humble bundle for $10. Mm -hmm. But how about this? What if YouTube did a thing that said, if I get to 1,000 subscribers, I'll start the program. If I get to 10,000 exactly. subscribers, yeah, I think so that's a great idea. demand base would be mm -hmm. incredible. Which you could actually just do on Indiegogo. You could say, you know, if I get exactly. this much. But, you know, I, I'm fascinated by this. And independent media, I was just talking to a, a director friend of mine, Austin um, Chick, who is, uh, you know, he's done a couple of independent films. And he um, he's looking at this space. And my friend Nick Jarecki, who just did Arbitrage with Richard Gere, like, they're really making big money on VOD. Arbitrage made $10 million on VOD or $20 million on VOD. It set all the records. Uh, and... This is that's becoming viable as well. So what we're seeing is this this whole new way to make sustainable media, and the budgets are going to go from five hundred dollars a minute to five thousand, and then the budgets that are coming up from YouTube, I think, will match the budgets that are coming down from TV and independent film. So what kind of what kind of things are going to work best? I think Gina knocked uh, the ball out of the park there. I mean, you have to have a passionate audience mm -hmm. that believes in the content. So if you look at this week in startups, it's like, okay, I'm, a, I'm into startups. I really believe in this. But religious nuts, I mean, religious people. Uh, <laughs> Gina didn't say nuts. I did. Uh, re there's religious people who would uh, obviously be very inclined. Uh, political um, folks. Political folks, I think is a really good one. About, Education. How about comedy? Because uh, Aziz Ansari oh, and Louis C.K. And... I think Louis, well, I mean, Louis C.K. has done it already. So if Louis yeah. C.K. said, yeah, Louis C.K. could make it work too. Yeah, if he said, I'm going to just do a 30 minute stand up bit every month for $5, yeah, it would get a ton of people. Right. But why would he, now the question is, why would he give 45% or 30%, whatever it is going to be, to YouTube? Right? Because he's got an email list. Right. He anyway, it's interesting it stuff. Let's do the next story. Marshall, right. anything to add there? Uh, I can imagine a YouTube Prime kind of experience. You know, you pay for a, a premium subscription level and gain access to premium content uh, that where the uh, revenue is split, and you get uh, next day delivery of all your videos. Let me ask uh, my my two guests here, Gina and uh, Marshall. Are you guys going to watch House of Cards? And do you know what that is this weekend? Yes, I know what it is, and I. Th I think I'm going to watch it. Um, I love binge watching, but I'm kind of into Downton Abbey season three. So I'm catching up on that. So that yeah. might actually be my weekend. Um, but it actually is making me want to get Netflix, give it another try. Like I, I got rid of my subscription probably about six months ago, in part because on demand was working so well for me. Um, so I might try it again. Um, yeah. Well, I, I uh, what, what about you, Marshall? Do you even know what we're talking about? I wonder. Oh yeah, I, I heard uh, some interviews with those folks on NPR, uh, and I, I find these kinds of things pretty interesting. But all my TV uh, is over the web now. It's you know it's either uh, Hulu or Netflix or, or other means, um, and I, we'll see just how how different it feels. It does drive me crazy to to uh, have to watch one episode of Homeland, uh, you know. Uh, a week and not be able to, to watch more than that until the next one comes out. So that's that's cool. binge <laughs> is what it's about. Clearly, binge viewing. If you don't know what that is, that's a term that I heard for the first time this week. You just did you see the news, everything. Jason? That uh, that Amazon swiped uh, Downton Abbey away from Netflix this week. Huge, huge news. Uh, I've seen all of s season three. I just want to put it out there. I saw all of season three in December. <laughs> Because I got the hookup. Um, but I love to see that kind of competition for, for great content. Absolutely. You know, so wait, now, Gina, where, you're, you're watching season three? Yeah, so I'm episode, I just finished episode three last night. So okay. I, you know, unfortunately. With no, the no, internet, spoilers. no spoilers. No spoilers. No spoilers. No like, spoilers. I, I, you know, I go, I go to my Twitter feed on Sunday night, and the next thing I know, I know what happens. So I'm like, okay, that's, 
it was not what I was looking for this evening, but it's not going to ruin it for me. Do you My want... favorite is when the when the when the uh, dowager countess says. Uh, She's like, well, you know, and, I, and, and Matthew's like, well, you know, I, I could work on it on the weekends. And she looks and she goes, what's a weekend? What are weekends? What's a, what are weekends? <laughs> <laughs> or she tells her, don't, don't be so down. It's very middle class of you. <laughs> She's the best. It really is like the best show on TV. Oh, but I got the total tip for everybody. Sherlock is another BBC series. Have you seen it, Gina? Yep. Oh, my God. It is like, if you took Law & Order SVU and you just had like... Another group of writers spend a month on every episode and that made every episode 50% longer, it would be Sherlock. Like, it's just, a, it's like a movie. And there's only like three or four episodes per season, but my God, is it amazing. And it's, it really is like this great competition now. Uh, but for those who don't know, uh, House of Cards is the... It's a new Netflix original drama. It's a political drama starring Kevin Spacey. It's the first show made specifically for Netflix, and it's going to be released in its entirety so it can uh, allow for binge consuming, as we were just talking about. And the budget for that, I think, was $100 million or something like that, something crazy? I don't know exactly. And but I just read Amazon Studios, which we've been monitoring on the launch ticker. Amazon Studios optioned Zombieland as a TV show. And Zombieland was originally supposed to be a TV show, but they made it a movie because they said nobody will ever be able, you'll never be able to make, nobody will care, wants a zombie TV series. How you can do it? Well, now The Walking Dead, and now so right. they make zombie, they have option, now they're going to be Zombieland, but that's Amazon. So what I'm trying to figure out is where is Facebook and Yahoo in all of this? Like, and Apple, why, aren't, why isn't Apple, Facebook, and Yahoo funding original content? you think they'll ever do that, Marshall? Uh, I can imagine Yahoo. I mean, they've done little experiments with it, though, already. You remember Kevin, Kevin Seitz, uh, War Zones? Uh, yep. Uh, that, was, that was cool. But uh, I don't think it, I don't know how far and wide it went. I mean, Netflix is pouring gas on the fire. They said today that they were going to do some debt financing to, to stack up the, the coffers for more original content. Uh, but I, I can't imagine Facebook doing that. What do, you, what do you think, Gina? Are we going to see like yeah, it's, Facebook or it's Yahoo such jump in? A different, it's such a different DNA from a technology company. And yeah. I, I, I mean, I look at it and, you know, Netflix specifically has been experimenting in content and production, um, not, not original production like they're doing with House of Cards, but they've been experimenting with this for 10 years. So I, I think the idea of a, you know, when you're building a technology, especially a platform company, day in and day out, your mantra becomes, we're not a content company, we're not a content company, we're not a content company. So yeah. to become one overnight, I think is extremely dangerous, especially when there's so many people in um, LA and um, and New York that want to actually be content companies. It's, yeah. it's more about, the I think, those partnerships. Um, and actually, another example would be, look at how, how long it has taken YouTube to get comfortable with the idea of even funding content. Yeah. You know, this is, these are DNA shifts. Yeah, I think it's and been... And they take a long time. Uh, it's very astute observation because YouTube is, you know, that's, that was a big philosophical thing for Google. Like, oh, are we going to fund content? We're not a content company. But now it's like, well, YouTube is a content company. I mean, right. hello. I mean, well, what do you think Can't it is? It. It's, it's just, I mean, sure, there's a infrastructure under it, but it's a content company. It's a company. search engine. Yeah, it's a search engine. Sure it is, right. And the, the CNN debates that they host and all this other, and the Red Bull jump from space, like this is obviously, these are all platforms, right? Right, well, and then there's the Google X type projects, so they're... Yeah, I think they're getting more comfortable. Next story. All right. Let's keep the train so, moving. So you want to talk about uh, RIM now mm -hmm. being, has rebranded itself BlackBerry. Yep. And also unveiled the BlackBerry 10. Um, yep. U.S. sales of the BlackBerry 10 won't begin until March with the Z10 touchscreen. The Q10 keyboard model will come in April. Now, um, despite the uh, unveiling, the stock has fallen uh, quite a bit since then, 12% on Wednesday alone. Yep. Uh, it's about $13 a share right now. It was six, about $16 earlier in the week. Yep. Uh, commercial promoting BlackBerry 10 will be aired during the Super Bowl, and Alicia Keys is been named the global creative director, so... Oh, well, those last two things will change everything. Those last two things yeah, will change that's everything? that's how people buy their phones, right? Based on Super which Bowl musician is the creative director and the Super Bowl commercial, clearly. So <laughs> so do you think that these moves are going to bring BlackBerry back, and how much do the developers matter in making sure this is a, is a success? success? I pl I've played with it. Yeah, I know, you're a fan. And it's very well done. Walt right. Mossberg said he liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, routine, everybody said it was a solid product. The question is, is solid enough 
to compete in, a, in the land of exceptional. And I don't, Marshall, what do you think? Well, it, it does seem to be about user experience and apps and developers. I, I did a, a, some analysis in Little Bird of the BlackBerry developer channels uh, audience hmm. and uh, found that of the, the top 500 most influential mobile developers on Twitter, only 10% are following uh, the BlackBerry dev account, and it's not a particularly influential Ten uh, percent, uh, hmm. even in that spectrum, and more influential in that community are are startups like Flurry and Test Flight and Portland's Urban Airship. All have more uh, cachet amongst top mobile developers than the BlackBerry Developer Channel does right now. Wow. Well, there is like <laughs> ouch. Yeah, that's that's irrefutable evidence. Wow. You actually analyze with Little Bird. Get LittleBird.com for a little plug there. The developer community and who they follow, the mobile developer community, and who they follow, and they don't follow the BlackBerry account, which either means they don't care, or that account doesn't do a particularly good job of tweeting stuff. But that's a very good proxy, I think. Uh, Gina, what do you think? BlackBerry DOA, uh, any chance of survival? Uh, I think this market's moving so fast, and it's hard to come back after so much bad news. Yeah. And I think, you know, without sort of skipping ahead to Yahoo!, I think it's it's a great example of when you lead with um, when you lead with a Super Bowl commercial and Alicia Alicia Keys, yeah. Um, rather than product exceptionalism, as you say, and yeah. also, you know, getting people on your team who actually have reputations for building great products, yeah. Which is not Alicia Keys, despite how awesome she is. Yeah. I think I think you know it's just kind of putting lipstick on a pig. Yeah, it is a, I mean, they did catch up, I feel like, and but they haven't a, leapfrogged. And maybe it's a good time if Apple, people have perceived some weakness with Apple. Yeah, but I don't think people mm. buy their phones based on the perceived strength or weakness of the platform. Well, more people were interested in switching to like a Galaxy Note 2. Yeah, maybe then. but that's because the Galaxy Note 2 is a unique product. It's big, it's got great battery life, it's got a fast processor, it's the size of your head. I mean, there's a lot of great things about this goddamn device, uh, which I went and bought and played with. Um, so yeah, I feel like they haven't differentiated yet. Now, so what that means is I think they hit a, a single or a double, which means they got to hit a couple more in a row. And why they led without the keyboard makes no sense to me. The Everyone Blackberry loved is it. synonymous with keyboard, exactly. so they went with the non-keyboard version. So stupid, just terrible idea. Go with the keyboard first. What they really need to do is open source their operating system and make it available for free to everybody, because. The two other, I mean, I, th I, I view them that BlackBerry is not in competition with iPhone. I think they're in competition with these two, which is Windows and Android. And so Windows is closed, right? They got the ecosystem, and it's, I've been playing with the Windows stuff. It's really good. Uh, and Android's really good now. Um, but I can tell you that people like Samsung want to have multiple operating systems so mm -hmm. that they're not locked in, so they don't have a situation happen with their hardware like BlackBerry had. Right? Got it. So, so for Samsung willing. wants multiple players in the market. So give Samsung the operating system. Let them make some money off the operating system, right? And they put it in a beautiful package. Exactly. They're, and Samsung is making the best hardware, clearly. Uh, let's do the next story. All right. Well, let's, since uh, Gina brought it up, the Yahoo earnings call this week, it was yep. the first full quarter with uh, Marissa as CEO. Mm -hmm. Revenue was up 4% year over year to $1.35 billion. Uh, the search revenue grew 14% in the fourth quarter to $427 million, and it was $1.6 billion for all of uh, 2012. That was up 9%. Mm. Um, I thought it was interesting that the price per ad on core Yahoo properties increased about 7% over Q4 2011 and 15% over Q3 2012. Um, now, the stock has been up and 26% gain in six months, mm -hmm. actually, so yep. that's pretty good. Um, Marissa has identified three key challenges, the increasing usage, growing international presence, and appealing to a broader demographic of users. So, All right, so how is this going to go now that the honeymoon's 26% over? 26% gain is probably not that much greater than the stock market. It's, it's probably double in the stock months. in six months. But there is a, definitely a Marissa factor increase in the stock price, but there's no way anybody could expect her to have any impact on you know, the 20-year revenue story of Yahoo in one quarter, right? Um, so I, I don't really look at it based on that. I look at it based on who is she getting on the team. And that's been a big What part companies of it. has she bought? Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, the second 
for the third, fourth, fifth quarter that she's in charge, some products need to come out that people go, oh, that's a very interesting product that has promise. Gina, what is your take? I think she's working on all the right things. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I believe that Silicon Valley and people who are watching want Yahoo to win. It's yeah. good for the ecosystem. It's good for startups. It's good for big companies. It, it's just good for everybody. Yeah. If Yahoo is a legitimate player in the market, and so I think that, you know, they're, the market will forgive, you know, missteps, and more importantly, you know, they believe in Marissa and they believe in Yahoo, and they just want it all to to, to work out. What do you think of her new? or her stated at Davos, she sort of said they want to be an aggregate. I mean, she basically said, we want to aggregate content. We want to be the place where you go to consume personalized content. What do you, what do you think of that as a vision for Yahoo? It's fine. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think you can go in the first quarter or even in the first six months and, and try to totally change the boat direction um, and I think, you know, I think everybody's just happy that there's someone at the helm who people feel like that they get the consumer internet and they get technology and they get products. And yeah. I think that it's less about trying to um, dissect a, you know, what is, what is always going to be a general straight, stated strategy up front, but, you know, what everybody I, I know is looking at is, is the execution. Yeah. The, the hires the acquisitions, the changes within the company. And I think, you know, everybody, again, everybody wants Yahoo to win. Yeah. Um, it, it's good for everybody. Yeah, it's pretty universal, I think, the support uh, that Marissa has. And, you know, I think she's got a pretty good runway. You know, I don't think people are going to look. If she keeps having great hires and, you know, buying a couple of interesting companies. She's and the stock content deals, too. Yeah, I think she's, I think she's got a decent, I think she's earned you know, through, she's got a lot of credibility she's earned up in that sort of credibility bank based on her, her performance over the, her career that people are going to give her the runway. Marshall, what's your thoughts? Well, uh, we had a key API that we were using over at Yahoo get deprecated recently, so I've got a chip on my shoulder. What is that, like uh, the Yahoo boss search stuff? Uh, placemaker, uh, oh. geocoder. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of thing keeps happening, which is a, a real bummer. But I, I look at... Uh, I, I, the fact that broadening the audience is one of three main goals seems just, I, I don't know, that really surprises me because I thought Yahoo was already about uh, a really broad mainstream audience already. And, uh, and if they think that aggregating news and giving personalized streams of content is, uh, is a, a way to go, that's, uh, that's a place where Facebook already started going quite some time ago. If, I, Jason, I'd be curious if you've ever used TimeHop. Uh, wonderful, wonderful app uh, funded by the Foursquare guys. Uh, they, uh, they show you what you did and where you went one, two, three years ago. Yeah. And three years ago today, I wrote an article about how Facebook was going around to all the major media companies uh, pitching themselves as the news reader of the future and the, the place where mainstream people would come to get their news. And I think that uh, they've made huge progress in that. And it's really late in the game for Yahoo to, to say they're going to go after that, that kind of market. It does seem that people are getting their news from their social feeds, whether it be Twitter or sure. Facebook first, and then falling back, not even to a reader, but to typing in domains and you know looking at the top five or six things out there. But it's a pretty good starting point, Twitter or Facebook, and, and it really has changed how people look at things. I, I liked her. Yeah. I do like them admitting they're a content company because I always tell the story. <laughs> Brian Alvey and I went there when we were doing Weblogs, Inc., and we had like f literally four or five meetings with different groups. What year are we talking? 2004, like 2000, no, 2003. And like one meeting was with the RSS team, one was with the My Yahoo team, one was with the ad sales group, one was with like the content group. It was just like literally we met with everybody. And we were hot at the time, so, you know, like people wanted to meet with us, and so... I said, watch this. We're going to go into this meeting, and the ad sales group that's doing this ad stuff is going to say they're not competitors, they're not in the content business. We go in, well, we're not in the content business, you know, da, da. unsolicited. I went to the next one. I said, now, I'm going to ask them if they're in the content business and watch them, like, stumble over it. 
So I asked like the RSS, are you in the content business? Like, no, no, we're not in the content business or whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, because you know, you guys hired like five bloggers for these different things. And right. you guys called our other five bloggers and you're seems like we're in the same business if you're trying to hire the people who work here at Weblogs Inc. They're like, no, 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 no. You got it totally wrong, Jason. We just want one blogger per vertical who's you know, that blogger is gonna sort of write one piece. It's just like a little tiny thing we're gonna sure. do. Mm -hmm. They've always, always, as Gina was sort of alluding to before, all these tech companies are like they begrudgingly want to be in the content business. I don't think what any of these people realize is the platforms are becoming, in a way, um, parity is reaching the platforms. And if they reach parity, then what's the differentiator? It's going to be content. It's going to be games. It's going to be the community. You know, there's, a, there's a smaller subset of things that matter once the platforms, you know, which, which we see in phones, right? Like, there's no difference between the iPhone, the Android phone, and the Windows 8 phone. I'm sorry. They all are exceptional products. I've been using all three trying to figure out which one's the best. They're all exceptional. So then if they're all exceptional, then what makes a determination? It's like, well, which one has the best content, right? Which one has the best apps, if you will? Well, and for you, which one is it? I don't know. I really honestly don't. I, you know, I, I, it's you like hard the to content tell. on the Windows phone? Um, in all honesty, I haven't been using the Windows phone. I've been using the Surface tablet and the, mm. and the desktop, so I just actually have it with me because I'm going to try to use it, and I just logged into my email, so I, I, too soon to tell on Windows 8. But I have to tell you, the, the Android experience now is greatly, greatly caught up to iOS. And I don't see a difference between iOS and Android. No, I love my Nexus 7. There's no difference mm -hmm. between iOS and Android right now. It's just 10%. You know, it's 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 under the just noticeable difference. What do you guys use, Gina? What are you on? You're Android or iOS? Uh, iOS. Yeah. Have you used Android in the last six months or year? I haven't. Yeah. See, so that's the thing I is, haven't. a lot of people, and you know, Gina's in the industry. A lot of people are like, you know, you get your phone, you change it every year or two. You may consider changing. So that's where, I think it's a the iOS people might have a big surprise coming because I think the loyalty that people feel towards towards iPhone five could be shaken by the different form factors and hardware and creativity that's going on in the Android ecosystem. Well, I have to tell you, my uh, horrible AT&T contract is up in about two weeks. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm going to buy an iPhone 5 and move to Verizon. And now I'm like, hmm. Maybe something else, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of good buzz going around. What are you on, Marshall? Oh, I, I'm a dedicated iPhone user for sure. Yeah. You know, Jason, I was just looking at this report on the, the top 500 mobile developers I've got in front of me and looking at Marissa Mayer, who's an active Twitter user. She's following 300 people on Twitter and not a single one of them is uh, among this group of 500 leading mobile developers. So if mobile's the future, uh, it seems that at least on that platform, that's not where she's engaging. Interesting. She's hmm. busy. Insights from Marshall. It's interesting. Actually, the statistics are pretty amazing. And I just unfollowed literally everybody on my Twitter feed and then started over from scratch. So for every, any of my friends who I'm not following yet, I'm literally adding like 10 people a day, 15 people a day. Hey, Marshall, can we get an analysis of Jason's followers? <laughs> of my followers? Uh, it, it might break the machine. Uh, I have 160,000 followers. I don't know who my followers yes. are. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll yeah. give me a couple of minutes. And all right, I'll, right. I'll we'll next story, next story. Curious. Okay, um, so Lyft had a He's huge He's going to be like, week. by the way, you're being followed by all of these like stripper accounts. Because this <laughs> right. is what happens when you have like a generic name. I watch my like incoming sometimes. I had to turn off that email because there's so many people like just. And I'm like, what are all these like spam accounts on Twitter? I guess it's all these like, what was the guy who, the football guy who got catfished oh, or whatever? I don't, remember I don't know his name. Toei, T.O.? Manateo. Manateo. Like, I, there's all of these fake, like, stripper, bikini model folks, like, following everybody all over Twitter. I, how does Twitter not have spam ha accounts under control at this point? And we're in year eight or something of Twitter. Like, can we please get spam under control? Next story. All right. So Lyft had a huge week. Uh, now has uh, moved yeah. into Los Angeles. Its starting zone is west of the 405. So that includes Santa Monica, West yeah. LA, Venice. Gonna Brentwood. Woohoo. Exactly. It's going to expand to downtown Silver Lake and West Hollywood. Yeah. Um, Lyft also reached a deal with the California Public Utilities Commission. These were the folks who were saying that Lyft was basically illegal. And they're waiving previous fines against Lyft and allowing it to continue operating while it's figuring out the future of rideshare regulations. Hmm. Um, also, Zimride, the parent company of Lyft, raised $15 million, led by Founders Fund, also including Mayfield, K9, and Floodgate. So how do you think Lyft will perform here in L.A.? And what are we looking at in terms of the future of regulation? Well, Gina, what are your thoughts? You use Uber, Lyft, Sidecar, any of this? 
I use Uber occasionally. Yeah. Um, and I haven't used Lyft yet, and I haven't used um, Sidecar. Sidecar. Like, I, I, I don't do a lot of moving away from my desk, so yeah. I'm, I may or may not be the best person <laughs> to, to ask. That's pretty but I do think, it, you know, I, I think that in California, there is so much um, momentum around experimentation. Yeah. You know, th this is a less, in, you know, we have less entrenched private transportation options and, yeah. and interests than you do in, say, New York. Yeah. Um, and that's just a reality of, of California. And I think, you know, even politicians would agree, that live in San Francisco would agree that there needed to be a better solution than the cab system in San Francisco. Now, did we need like 10 ride sharing services? Probably not, but that's cool. Yeah. And, um, and I think, I think it's, you know, this kind of experimentation is great. Uh, and I agree, and I'm glad to see that we're doing more experimentation. I will say I almost died in a sidecar. I told the story on the program. Yeah, like, I... the guy was just like, this is a really beat-up car. But what I like about this new regulation is that now, as part of this, they're saying, like, you have to do background checks on the drivers to make sure they're not serial killers. you got to make sure. I don't know if, like, they can be a felon and be a driver. but And I think some of these companies had their own. But Well, Lyft does interview the drivers before they're allowed yeah, out. Yeah, but interview is one thing. Like, you know, like, screening is one thing. Like, checking the insurance, inspecting the car. You know, like, they should have to go get their car inspected every 90 days. They should have to go to a Lyft, have it done, or they should... Or Lyft or Sidecar should have like a, a garage where they uh, co subcontract that the cars get checked because that's the fear here is that you know somebody is and we have this in New York with the gypsy cabs like there are all these like sure, dollar cabs be. gypsy cabs all this kind of stuff where like you just pay a couple dollars and you can go as far as you want to go you don't I mean it's just a person in a car like you don't you could, know you literally don't know it could be very dangerous um, but I found most interesting and obviously full disclaimer I'm an angel investor in Uber Uber is saying they're going to go up against uh, or they're going to have their own car sharing. And what's really great with this car sharing is the cost is so much less. Like, it'll be less than a cab ride because well, the people are just taking a donation. Sure, but you know what was interesting? So I used Lyft, like, four times this week in San Francisco. Oh, did you? And each ride, and, it, you know, they were all city rides, were all $10. So that's which, pretty good. Which I thought was interesting. Now, the interesting thing is that Lyft... Well, is that a donation? Right. It just says, it says, you know, it, suggested it, donation. it basically gives you the donation suggestion price. And of course, they want you to rate the driver like you would on Uber. Yeah. The interesting thing to me was that when I took an Uber, because there were no Lyft drivers available one night, and ah. I, I, so I was like, okay, well, then I'll go to Uber. Right. The Uber ride actually was $5. What? I, I don't know. That's a mistake because it's that a $15 been, minimum. Oh, you know what? It's because I probably had a $10 credit. Oh, yeah, $10 credit. So it's $15 minimum, right. So yeah. so that was, but still, that seems, yeah. seems like a pretty pretty low price. So I don't know. Uber has also announced recently that it lowered its prices. So oh, yeah? there must be some feeling that there's some more competition in the market here. And Lyft drivers are actually kind of more fun. I mean, an Uber driver definitely comes across as more serious. Like well, they're, they're professional. They're professional. Yeah. And, you know, you come into the Lyft car, they give you the fist bump, right? There's the pink mustache on the front of the car. Yeah, it's and fun. It's zany. Exactly. And all of them I spoke to, like, they were really happy as drivers. Just and think about how many people are unemployed in the country. And this is, like, a great way to make everybody's lives better and maybe sure. get some people's jobs. What do you think, Marshall? Do you use any of these services? Uh, my wife uses car to go uh, which has taken Portland by storm. Uh, but I, I think that uh, it's all just it's all just killing time until the driverless cars come, right? And uh, <laughs> so I've uh, never but, even heard of car to go. What is car to go? Uh, it's a, a German uh, company. Uh, well, it's a, a Daimler uh, like subsidiary. <laughs> And uh, they've got mm. programs in seven or eight cities around the, the world. And they're these little bitty smart cars. Um, and there's no membership fee. Uh, and there's a great iPhone app where you can find them. And people can just leave them anywhere inside of the uh, roughly city limits. And there's, there's uh, hundreds of them scattered all over Portland at any given time. And Maximum is... Seventy-three dollars a day plus tax, so eighty. Call it eighty bucks. Maximum is fifteen. Well, call it sixteen bucks an hour. Seventeen bucks an hour with tax. Thirty-eight plus tax per minute. Thirty-eight cents. Per, so if you ha you can just take these on. It's like a bike. You can just take them for a ride. Like That's from and cool. you don't have to return them. Nope. 
just inside of city limits, oh, basically. So that's you, uh, so genius. It's terrific. I mean, wait, wait, you live in uh, Portland? Of course, yeah. you live in Portland. You didn't know that? Like Portlandia, yeah. Portland? Yeah, you, I'm here in the offices of Wyden and Kennedy, uh, where. Uh, the Portlandia episode about the the crazy creative agency and the nest taking off and stuff like that. That's that's about this place where Little oh Bird is incubated. God, that's I, I now I remember all this. My God, Portlandia is on fire. They had this great episode. Like they go for raw food, and they're like, my God, I have to fart so bad. It's like raw food is terrible. And they they're like the woman's like, listen, we have a lot of complaints about you guys farting at the table. Why are you not using the fart patio at the raw food place? And they're like, the what? And they go out and there's like a fart patio and they hand them two fans and they just sit there and they're just like, every, there's like 10 people in the back, all the hipsters farting and blowing their farts with a fan. It's a riotously you know, funny. But is it anything like the, that? The, the rest of the country considers it comedy. Here in Portland, it's, it's more seen as documentary. <laughs> uh, I have heard that, that from another Portland person that it is somewhat... The dream pretty- of the 90s is alive in Portland. Next story. All right, so I know this is a topic that interests you. Mark Andreessen predicts the demise of traditional retail. Of course. So um, Mark Andreessen has said e-commerce 2.0 is really going to hit its stride in the next three to four years. Uh, retail, the real retail killer isn't an out-of-date business model, but experience that sites like Fab and Shoe Dazzle can offer now. Yeah. Um, the most successful online retailers are in New York and LA. As to why the Valley hasn't had that kind of success, he said, my core theory is that the best software companies will win at retail, so it'll become increasingly important for these companies to have the best software programmers in, in the world, and there are a lot more of them in the Valley. So how far are we from the death of the traditional retailer, and what can retailers do to make themselves more relevant? What do you think, Gina? Well, I'm not in retail. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I build different kinds of software. I would say that you know, Mark is wonderful at making dramatic statements right. um, that are thought-provoking and interesting, and generally over very long periods of time tend to come true. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think if you think about a 10-year time horizon with just what's happening right now in terms of showrooming yeah. that it's outside the realm of possibility you know and at the same point in time i think there's a lot of time and a lot of energy that is going to go into experimentation in terms of retail and the physical world and what the integration of online and offline is going to look like so yeah i'm going to agree with gina gen- gen- general trend sure um and yet at the same point in time, I also think we have a lot of time to figure this all out in the same way that, um, you know, you saw the emergence of big box retailers. They're not, they're not as relevant today, and that's okay. Um, I think there's interesting opportunities that are going to come as we, you know, continue to see a drop in costs of creating new and interesting kinds of retail experiences. And I think that's a really good thing. Um. It's pretty clear that um, it's. He, I don't think Mark. Uh, Gina's right. Mark is being hyperbolic, and he, he tends to do that sometimes, make a big grand statement or whatever. Like newspapers are going to die, but obviously newspapers haven't died. They're changing, right? So change is really what this is about. And if you think about it, um, the experience of the Apple Store was transformative. And I'm not sure. I don't think Mark has kids, but if, now that I have a three-year-old, like retail's not going anywhere. I can t- I can tell you that like. We're going to the Disney store again, you know, like, guaranteed. That doesn't get old. That is not going away. And, yeah. you know, like, it, there's a social aspect to shopping, which I think actually might accelerate. Because when I had Jason Goldberg of Fab on the program, he is obsessed with doing a physical store. He wants to do a physical store. And you saw the MakerBot store when you were in And New the York. MakerBot store. So, you know, the, the reason to do it, yes, it, they're highly inefficient. So we're going to see this collapse of the idea of a mall and the malls are getting redone. So obviously there's going to be this massive contraction. But then here's the quote uh, from Jeff Bezos in conversation with Charlie Rose. We would love... Uh, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos, master, was he ready to take on uh, Walmart? We would love to, but only if we can have a truly differentiated idea. I don't want to do a Me Too product offering. We, when, when I look at the physical retail stores, it's very well served. The people who operate physical retail stores are very good at it. The question we would have always have before we'd embark on such a thing is, what's the idea? What would we do that would be different? How would it be better? We don't want to be redundant. And I have heard from people that Amazon is actually working on this in a major way. They, there will be Amazon stores. I can almost guarantee that. Now, what would they be? 
I think they're going to be the best of Amazon, where you go in and you see the highest rated products. And I've written about this. Like yep. They should do something like that. And Fab should do the best thing. That it's experiential commerce. It's a place to go and experience the products. So it would be like, like an the Apple Tesla store. Stores, or the Tesla store. Right. You know, like just trying to make an experience. And you don't need as many stores as we have. It's ridiculous the amount of square footage for retail. And But I did, I have to tell you, I was, the economy is definitely back. Because on two Saturdays ago, I took London out, my, my three-year-old. We went to the Disney store. We went to have dinner. Everybody was walking around with shopping bags. I would say one out of three people had a shopping bag. And they weren't like tiny like shopping bags. People, you know, multiple shopping bags in some cases. And there were lines at every restaurant. We had to go to like three restaurants. And this is Santa Monica in January, three weeks after the holidays. Like this is not prime time. It's cold here, you know. But It's cold here. you yeah. got to be careful when you say okay, that. Comparatively speaking, Marshall, what do you think? I, I wonder if retail will see a change more like what medicine is going through. You know, there's uh, an increasing number of, uh, of medical treatments and exams that are going to happen uh, virtually, uh, if not by mobile. Uh, and a big part of the infrastructure, like uh, appointment setting or, uh, or low-level medical interventions are being done uh, in these new little... Uh, tiny clinics, like we've got a place called Zoom Care uh, next door to our office here where you, you make a reservation online, just like on a Google Calendar type interface. You drop in a, a registered nurse or a nurse's assistant uh, sees you. you, you plunk down 75 bucks and you're out the door. And I, I can imagine retail uh, going through something like that, something like the the, uh, the Apple Store kind of, of ethos and changing a bunch, but uh, but not going away, especially yeah, for people with kids or uh, other than super high-end uh, experiences, it's uh, but it should be real interesting. Uh, I think that's very astute. Um, I was just made aware. I'm not sure exactly how. Maybe it was somebody uh, for an angel investment, but of this one medical.com group, and I went to their website and I was like, look at this. It looks like you're going to the W Hotel or you know a spa. And like nice furniture, it looks like it could be in Portland or something. That's probably guys probably got those big hoop earrings. But like, I guess they started in Noe Valley or something. And you sign up, and I think you pay $149 a year. And then the pricing is on the website. You become a member, and uh, you can pay with your health insurance. But they have like a membership, and they have the fee schedule. I guess is published here. You know, just and makes it a, a delightful experience. Just makes it like you're not going to get ripped off and it's like just taking out all the pain. Well, and just some doctor's offices are just so dreary. People work there aren't happy. They're, yeah. you know, there's always these sad, sad old magazines on the tables and yeah. the furniture looks dated. And Oh, here's the other thing. They start the appointments on time. That was like in their thing. Same day appointments that actually start on time. Like, talk about understanding your customers. Like, what is the most annoying thing is the wait at the doctor's office. Like... Why yeah. is there a wait there? It's like, not the, what, 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 what is, what doctors are like, the Dalai, I'm, I'm waiting in line for the Dalai Lama. I'm not waiting in line for a doctor. Come on. Lawyers start the meetings on time. Why can't a doctor start the meeting on time? Crazy. So Jason, here in Portland, we have another company called Meridian that is, uh, they call themselves Indoor GPS. And they're working with retail companies to uh, augment the offline retail experience where you walk into a store, pop open your phone, and the, phone, the store knows who you are, where you are, all your shopping history. You now Walmart's doing some of that same kind of work with their mobile apps. It's not for when you're at home, it's for when you're in the store to, uh, to make the retail in-person shopping experience a, a richer, more fun, uh, more efficient, effective kind of, kind of experience. That is pretty slick because I have to say, like I was, I just had this experience at a mall. I was in, uh, I was at that mall in, again with my daughter, like looking for the the Froyo place in the mall in San Francisco Westfield Mall, and I was like, where is this Froyo place? It's making me crazy to find this place. And she's like, she wants her Froyo. I can't find the Froyo. It's a smart idea. Smart idea. Okay, let's do the final story. Okay, I think we got to talk about Nick Denton bringing Valley Wag back. Oh, kill yourself. Oh, I hate Nick Denton. All right, so... i got to stop using that term. Ugh. Yeah, not appropriate in this episode. So yeah, it's sorry. a gossip blog that was started in 2006. It was the first site to question Steve Jobs' health, credited with breaking the news on Twitter's birth. Um, <laughs> Loathsome. Nick, Nick has said he's searching for an editor or two to run it. It won't necessarily be a standalone site. It'll have some writers, but most posts will be on uh, Gawker as well as Valley Wag. Um, exactly also, what we don't need. also to test Gawker's new discussion platform, Kinja allows users no, to comment, well, cool. add photos, yeah. video, start their own thread with a unique URL. So, is this a good time to bring it back? And 
how should it be different than before? All right. Well, it would be a good start if it was actually factually correct and it didn't bring civilians into the mix. So I'll tell you the story. You want to hear the story? Sure. They put my wife on there in a picture. And I called McDetton. and I said, hey, you put my wife on there. When was this? Five, six years ago. Okay. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, take that down. You know? and so we're, we're sort of friends. But then I had lunch with him in person. And I said, listen, let me explain something to you. Like, I'm not going to sue you or I'm not going to get in a fight with you. If you do this again, I'm going to punch you in the face. I'm from Brooklyn. You don't mess with people's wives or their kids or their families. So if you want, you can take me to task all day long. But I don't know if you've ever been punched square in the face, but that is what I will do to you if you t do anything like this to my family. And what, had he said anything in particular about her? Nothing, but they, they were starting to buzz around her and they took a picture of her and it, it was just like she was in the background of a picture. And I just okay. said, listen, just, she's a civilian. And he agreed. He's okay. like, we don't need to go into civilian. Thing. But then they started getting into my friend's personal lives and stuff like that. I was like, this is not appropriate. And I said, Nick, like, what, what, you want people following you around and your personal life? Like, he's got a pretty robust personal <laughs> life. Let me tell you, I've heard the stories. You should publish them. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do is publish stories about Nick Denton's all crazy sex page life. All about page baby. It's all about the page views, right? No, it's not for me. But anyway, listen, I just... Denton's a really smart guy. He's, he's, listen, he's like a genius publisher, but I got, I hated Valleywag because it was like, I watched my friends, like, they just rode some people so unfairly for so long, and it was just like so inaccurate. You know, it was all Owen Thomas, who was a complete troll, and was completely, would write stuff that was so factually inaccurate. They, did they ever have to go after you, Gina? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That was fun. Yeah. It's a good time. Yeah, it's like, oh, you're, a f and also it's like, oh, female founder, wow, let's pile on that. You know, it's like just any weakness they can sense or any like angle they can get. And, and just Owen Thomas is such a piece of garbage. Like, so, and so I told him too, I was like, Owen, you were such a talented writer when you wrote for Suck and these other things. And now he's working for Business Insider. And I think he realizes he was in a dark place. Like he, he was so obsessed with just getting page views and stuff like that. It's like, these people are just hardworking well, business people. You could argue Business Insider is still obsessed with page views. Right, but I don't think that Henry Blodgett is going to take apart somebody's personal life, you know, mm. like, in, a, in that kind of way. Like, it, report on people professionally. But link not baby there. headlines, sure. Yeah, link baby headlines, you know, like, oh, Jason Calacanis' seven biggest mistakes. Sure, go for it. But, like, I don't need you to talk about my family or other stuff. It doesn't make sense. Marshall, uh, you're really thrilled with this, I'm sure. Oh, it, it's, uh, you know, a, a car accident with that people rubberneck at and uh, it, it doesn't doesn't seem like a very uh, considerate, empathetic, responsible uh, thing to do, but um, whatever. I mean, See, what drives Denton is he likes to, I actually think Denton has a higher moral calling at times, which is he hates hypocrisy. And he likes to take down anybody he believes is a phony or deserves to be taken down. And in Gawker, you do see that at times. Like, they're railing against the gun nuts right now. And they're doing such a good job of it. Like, it's really great. They're You're like, not really going to complain about that type <clears throat> of coverage. Well, it's sort of like they're just pointing out the hypocrisy, right? And okay. so, like, I, I, I applaud that, right? And if somebody is Mel Gibson and they're... You know, Lance Armstrong or Lance Armstrong. Like if there are people who are asking for it and they're like anti-Semitic or they're lying cheaters who, you know, attack people. Sure. Uh, or gun control nuts who are like fighting for unreasonable gun control. Like the same day people are getting shot and killed. Like, of course, like these are good targets. I think I could put them in like good targets. They should be challenged. Right. But you don't need to challenge somebody about their private life who's just a civilian in their sex life or their dating life. It just doesn't make sense. And I think, I think that's one, where he missed the mark on Valleywag. Yeah, I think the one other thing that I would observe is, you know, when you're on the inside of things, you can, you know, you see, you see like, different things happen. And most of the time, what gets reported in blogs, even, you know, more salacious um, stories, has some kernel of truth to it. Yeah. The interesting thing to me about Valleywag is whether it was, I, I've, never, I've never seen either before or since stories made up ab absolutely out of thin air. Like that, they, that there's absolutely no basis 
yeah, of that's truth correct. in what it was, and yet it still was reported yeah. as such. Absolutely. And, and that, that is what I think is the difference. The other thing that I would add is I actually think that, that the place of Valley Wag was taken by Quora, of mm. all places. Ah. And I think what's nice about Quora for like the place to go for, um, you know, people asking the question typically anonymously and anonymous answers and all that is that at least you have a choice to respond in, in a, I would say a more thoughtful way and, and in a more thoughtful community. So I'm also just wondering if it's going to see any kind of uptick because I think if, if the show you know, on Bravo, set, you know, it's demonstrated anything, it was that people really don't give that big of a sh about what's happening in Palo Alto or San Francisco. Um, I think that's uh, of another really astute uh, um, point. And somebody asked the question, will Mahalo ever make up for the 20 million in venture capital that has ever been committed to it? And Jimmy Wales, of all people, comes to my, res my rescue. Never count Jason out. Yes, he's arrogant, he's irritating, and he's often wrong, as he is right. But when he's right, he's right. And when he's wrong, he kicks his own ass. Yeah, that's pretty pretty nice. And I wrote a big long blog post, but it was obviously like somebody who's like a disgruntled employee or somebody, you know, it's like, so, or somebody who just is a hater is like, ah, you know, and. Or it could have been a serious question. I mean. Or I guess it, I mean, I, I mean, don't know. color blew how many millions of dollars? I guess so. I mean, I've, but this company's made a lot of money and we're still here and we're still making millions of dollars a year. So anyway, but the point is, I do think that they could like, you're right, uh, Gina, Valley Wag would paint a certain picture of that. And then I can come in and just answer it. And I answered it like, honestly, like, listen, we made this amount of money from SEO. We've made six, seven, eight, eight figures worth of revenue from, you know, search traffic and all this kind of stuff. It worked out very well, but it wasn't personally fulfilling for me. Now I'm doing this other stuff that is personally fulfilling. It is working. We have millions of dollars in the bank, millions of dollars in revenue. We're almost break even. It's all good. And well, I think Nick also said about bringing Valley Wag that he kind of thought it was the right time because he thinks there's a kind of a bubble about to burst and there's going to be more bloodshed of some kind. And he no. has some kind of delight in covering that. I don't think there's going to, I don't know. What do you think, Marshall? Is there a bubble or no? Is there going to be like some massive bloodbath coming? I don't think so. Oh, I, I hope not. I, I don't <laughs> think so. I Says mean, the I first the time entrepreneur is... in the first year of his business. <laughs> yeah. Good timing, yeah, Marshall. <laughs> I, I would also say, if, you know, if people don't think there's a correlation between that kind of snarky, gosh, let's pile on the bloodbath in the first story we started with. I mean, yeah, this stuff is, is difficult for anybody. Um, the idea of having blogs dedicated to schadenfreude yeah. um, just seems like a really unfortunate idea. Yeah, that's a very good uh you should host your own show, Gina. She's good. She's great. She just threaded the needle there. She just threaded the needle for me. It is true. You know, and it's like, um, I do think this, like, public, you know, chiding of people or, like, this, like, when you invest in companies and when you start companies, we all know the majority case is failure. And if the majority case is not failure, then we're starting s safe companies, right? So just to sort of go full circle, it... Marshall, you're starting a company, you're a first-time entrepreneur. Congratulations. You got Mark Cuban to invest. Everybody's talking about your startup. The still majority of cases, you're going to fail, Marshall. Oh, 70, 80% sure. yeah. chance. You realize that, right? You better believe it. He's still doing it. And if you do fail, Marshall, no big deal. Like, you, you know, like I was just talking to somebody who was failing, and they're like, what, you know, what do you think? And I was like, wrap everything up in a classy fashion. Give everybody a great amount of severance you know, do the AccuHire thing or do this or whatever. And um, immediately start, do not disappear. Go out there, write blog posts, talk about it, talk about the failure, what you learned from it. Is this somebody we should have on the show? Well, we'll talk in three months, four okay. months. But yeah. anyway, that, that was, the, I was like, just mm -hmm. embrace it. Mm -hmm. You tried, it was an epic try. It wasn't an epic failure or an epic success. It was just a single or a double or whatever. You struck out, who cares? But, you know, embrace it and make it part of who you are. You are now part of the group of people who knows how to deploy capital, knows how to raise venture capital, knows how to deploy it, knows how to run a board meeting, knows how to do all this stuff. How to and hire. Can, and know how to do close a transaction. Right. You know, like right. you, you have all this stuff now. Congratulations. Now people are going to look at you and say, oh, you've, you've got 90% of it down. You just got to get that last part, scaling a business right. So let's just, let's give you another shot at bet. It's a better bet. 
Ben Horowitz says that it's it's good to know what a, an entrepreneur has done before because everything else is going to take a long time to learn, but you can count on them doing the things that they that they've done before all the faster. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, listen, it's been an amazing episode. Everybody, uh, follow. Jason, me. do you want to hear the uh, the numbers oh, about oh, mobile God. developers and your? So you <laughs> yes, please, you, Jason, me in general. Uh, well, you are being followed by 65 of the top mobile developers uh, on the on Twitter, oh. uh, which is substantially more than the BlackBerry development channel is. There you go. Uh, the the most recent is uh, the co-founder of Temple Run. If oh, you're really? Familiar with that game, she just started following you, Natalia Lukyanova. Uh, no, she was the first one to start following ah. you. The most recent is Dave Johnson, the uh, co-founder of of PhoneGap. Hmm. Uh, that uh, Adobe acquired recently. See? You, however, are not following any of those top 500 people back. Yeah, they're, they're listening to you, though. That's well. That's the way it should be. There you go. Now, meanwhile, no. over the adult content, as the uh, ah! there's, there's no intersection at all Thank between you. our report uh, on adult content and your account. You're not following them. They're not following you. You can uh, go forth in in peace. I can tell you, path is starting to scale right now because I am getting like Russian or Chinese, like obviously like looking for husband accounts or phishing accounts, right? They could either be sure. one of those two things. It could be legitimately sure. like, but I'm like, path is private. Like how, they must be just typing in first names or whatever and just randomly adding people, but it's really going international because I'm getting people from Singapore, China, I mean, Russia. Don't You can't be adding more friends at this point, can you? I can't say that I have a special account. That maybe allows say, me to have a couple more friends. I was gonna than say. Person. I'm not allowed to say. <clears throat> hmm. mm -hmm. All right. But I may be able to have more friends than you. That's fine. None of my um, real friends and family are on so it. So can I get, what's the story, Marshall? Will you, will you hook me up with like an unlimited account so I can start doing these incredible queries on Get Little Bird myself? Sounds good. Ah, there you go. I'll mention it. See that? I plugged the sh sugar out of that. <laughs> Everybody go check out Get Little Bird for $250, $500 a month. You are going to become a genius. And everybody follow uh, at Marshall K. Uh, everybody follow at Gina B. And check out Mighty Bell, her startup. She's in there uh, rolling up her sleeves. I met the team over there. It's a smart, smart group. Uh, and she's got some big announcements coming in five weeks from the stage of the launch festival of all places. Thank you for deciding. <laughs> nice try. She's going to take, why don't you, listen, we all know it ends on Wednesday. Nothing happens Wednesday morning. You just come back Thursday night on somebody's private jet on Tuesday night. And then you launch on Wednesday. They'll forgive you. <laughs> They'll forgive you. Come on. Come on. Do we have enough women uh, judges at this point? We, we, we could definitely use more and Gina would be awesome. I'm always trying to make sure there's some gender balance. Always happy to fill your quota. No, it's not that. No, it's you're, that just, you're brilliant. Just, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But no, I always, now, you know what? I'm really becoming like, you know, you have a daughter. You obviously become even more aware of these things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm on a personal jihad right now to get people to stop calling women girls. That's a good, good thing. You know, I went to a women's college and people are like, oh, you went to an all girls school? I say, yes, I went to a women's college. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's like we <laughs> hired two people to work at launch and somebody kept saying like, oh, ask the girls to do it. Ask the girls to it. I'm like, do we have interns or something from like a high school or something? Like their names are Emily and Beth. Right. Cool. And I got to meet them and this week said, well, and they're real I, people. Somebody said to me, what do we call them? And I said, their names, the name, their names <laughs> or women. Like why? If, I mean, can you imagine if you hired two men and you started calling them boys? boys. Oh, why don't you give it to the boys to do? I'm so <laughs> hyper aware of it now. Well, I'm also hyper aware of it too. Cause I see like, yeah, I grew up like a white, I'm a white guy, you know, like we don't have. You, you have know, all like, the privileges. Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest thing I deal with is like, oh my God, I've been invited to too many different private clubs to be a member. Which one should I pick? First like, which golf clubs should I be a member of? Which private <sighs> clubs should I be a member of? Like, that's what guys, white guys deal with. Then my wife is Asian. I had no idea what Asian, Asian people are like one of the, like, last uh, groups that you can just outwardly make fun of. Well, like the Make Me Asian app that got pulled from the Google Play Store? Unbelievable. Imagine if you had Make Me Black app, Make Me African American, That would never have worked. Make Me Jewish app. Like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, let's, let's put Hasidic curls on people. It's like, no, we can totally make a Make You Asian app. Approved. Oh. Well, Jason, I'll, yes. I'll send you uh, an email with the names of the, the five most influential women in the tech incubator scene. Uh, yeah, that actually, that would be actually helpful. I'm always trying, you know what the other thing is with the tokenism is like, 
everybody's like, oh, here's the VP of marketing or a PR person to put on the, you know, we go through this, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we're not really, like we need people like Gina who've actually built businesses or Marissa or somebody who's actually built a business. Uh, okay, thank you, Gina. Thank you, Marshall. We'll see you again next time. Hey, and stick around because Source Bits is going to show us the new Launch Festival app. All right. I will thank let you, you go, Gina. Uh, and thank I will you, let you Jason. go, Marshall. Thank you for everything. That was a great, great guest, huh? It was amazing. Gina, we got to have Gina back soon. Gina threaded the needle on that. That was really, she's smart, man. She didn't get mm -hmm. enough credit. I wish she blogged or something, man. She's smart. Smart cat. All right. Uh, everybody knows the Launch Festival is just 30 days away. You've been seeing all these great companies. You were just in the Valley. Oh, my God. I've... I'm sending you back up next week, right? You're going to go back I up? I will probably go next week again. Yeah, I just guess. go up for the whole week and just, let's just lock this down. But how many companies did you see when you were up there? About. I saw in three days at least 25. Oh, good. Of yeah. those, how many oh, would you think I would accept? Oh. 10? I would say at least half. Oh, good. Awesome. I mean, it was really, really high quality stuff. Great. And so Great. I just need to get you all that stuff so you can take a look. Let's work on it over the weekend. Maybe yep. Just email me as we go. I'll just I will one do that. off, say thank you, and yep. yes, and do. So, Jason, maybe we can talk a little bit about what the app is going to be for those who don't know yet. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so we had this concept to have uh, crowdfunding occur live at the event. Yep. We wanted people to uh, look at the companies on stage and say, that's a great idea. Here's how much I would invest in it. Right. Crowdfunding or otherwise. And so obviously crowdfunding is not exactly um, a reality yet. The SEC is still working on it. So this is going to be a simulation, if you will. Uh, but we will ask for people to identify themselves as accredited investors if they right. are. Right, and we will uh, pass, basically we're going to pass all this information on. But look at that splash screen, Micro Ventures Presents. We've got a sponsor uh, who's in the microfinance space who is uh, helping uh, um, sponsor the event, launch live crowdfunding. Oh, look at that. Wow, where'd you get that stock image of a, uh, that's beautiful. Well done, uh, Great David. looking screen. Where'd you get that from? What is that? Do you guys take that picture? Or is that a stock image or something? It's yeah, gorgeous. That's a stock image that we had put together. Ah, uh -huh. gorgeous. I love it. Uh, so you got the launch logo coming to life. Uh, and then here, uh, live funded, this uh, launch dollars. We put the L there, right? Because we're going to say launch dollars so Jason doesn't wind up in jail. Um, but we'll see, like, what's crowdfunded so far. Let me just put this on full screen. Uh, super startup. And we have their domain. That's great. Uh, so the domain is there. And we have the Twitter account. And you'll be able to just go right through those. And, ah, here we go. Oh, this is the intranet here? Tell me what I'm looking at here. Can you guys see it? No, Jason, I can't see your screen. Oh, OK. So I'm looking at what is, I guess, the companies, the intranet for adding a company. Correct. Uh, and the you presenter's the name. Screen. Yeah, so this yep. is going to be great. We add them, and then we unlock them, I guess. When they're on stage, we just click the unlock button, and then they're magically appearing in everybody's app? Correct. Wow. And look at how beautiful. I didn't realize you guys did uh, really great intranet designs as well. Look how beautiful that is. It's beautiful, because yeah. uh, we're the ones who are going to have to use that. Yeah. Yeah. And you would think like that would be like an afterthought, but it's not. Not, oh. not by my friends at uh, Squarespace. And then were there... Oh, so... Source bits. How do you guys ensure that uh, design gets built uh, accurately during the engineering process? There's my first question. Okay. Um, just as during the design process, we had engineering present um, to make sure that what we designed could be built, um, we just kind of flip roles. Um, I'll hand add JIT, all the graphics, development, then takes those and starts to implement, and we just uh, take a back seat and help them match up and make sure everything is uh, implemented correctly. Got it. And. Uh... So we made some late changes. How did that impact the project? Uh, did we slow you guys down a little bit? Um, I think I'll take that question, Jason. Um, one of the uh, you know, approaches to engineering that we follow is the Agile method. Um, so what that does is basically helps us to iteratively build on features that are not very uh, you know, closely defined. So you know, in situations like these, I think there's a perfect example of uh, a challenge in a really tight deadline project where uh, you know, there's something else that you need, uh, you know, in the app. Um, but then since we work in an agile fashion, we are able to take that as a requirement and then add it as part of the next sprint uh, of our, our development. Um, so in terms of the timeline itself, uh, this does not have any major impact. 
because I think thanks to the design guys, I think they have accounted for um, you know some some buffer here. Um, so so I think it just panned out pretty well, and we're still on track. And uh, I guess here is the um, beautiful uh, man. The, the wireframes are gorgeous. It's almost, I almost feel like the wireframes are so good looking they could just be the app. Uh, but good looking wireframes here. Are you an accredited investor? Yes or no? What does that mean? First name, company name, email address, and phone number. What is an accredited investor? We sort of explain that to people. And uh, you can just see here are the companies as they're getting unlocked and what time. And you're going to be able to. Um, you know, do live crowdfunding, if you will. Uh, now, the money's not going to transfer this year, but I'm thinking next year, next year we should be able to have the money transfer and we'll have our friends at SourceBits actually build that as part of the engineering challenge for the 2014 event, or even if we were to do an event in the fall, which I'm not saying we're doing or not, we'd, but if we did, you could actually do that as well. So this is very interesting. Um, and uh, so I guess, th was this technically challenging for you guys i get the sense that this was an easy app to build technically and that the technical challenge wasn't the issue here it was the design and making a beautiful challenge am i correct uh, david do you want to take that question or uh, yeah that's fine i think i'll i'll take that question um you know the the, the way we operate at source bits uh, we do have the design led engineering uh, concept deeply rooted in our dna uh, you know what that means is that the design guys, you know, headed by David and Gary, uh, you know, they're all needing uh, into the phase of the project at the start. Um, then what happens is, uh, you know, this then flows down to the engineering team, uh, where we are responsible for the execution of the creative ideas. Um, so I think there's a very subtle balance between design and engineering. Um, so if you actually see the final output, uh, it's going to be an amalgamation of both of them. Uh, which is going to define what uh, you know source code actually has to offer. Uh, so you know, technically, it is a challenge uh, on both regards. Awesome, uh, and we're going to limit people to uh, ten thousand launch dollars. Yep. So you, even if you're not like a real investor, like a credit, okay. if you're not in credit, you're a civilian, you can pick up to ten thousand dollars because we think if you're there, you probably are somewhat baller and might have access to ten dimes. One high, everybody gets one high society on JCal to invest. Very good. Um, and uh, yeah, this is going to be awesome. I'm super psyched about it. Um, so what, what's, what are we, where are we at next, Karen? Do you have any idea of where this is at next? or do, How are we going to, we have to I, tell the companies about this too, right? I have been mentioning it to the people good. I've spoken to. And what's the reaction? They're pretty uh, I interested. think that's cool, yeah. yeah. Especially if it means that they can find out who those accredited investors are who are interested in them. Right, because they're going to be able to follow up. Exactly. And that's what we're going to do. So that's actually, exactly. do we have that piece done yet, guys? How we, um, how we uh, get the information to, my God, this is looking gorgeous. I'm so excited. I do have a link to oh, test Oh, look, at, here it is. Here it is. Look at that. this. This is, what, wait, you have a link to a test flight of this? Uh, I got that from DeMont this morning. Oh, whoa. Wait, well, how about me getting a test flight? <laughs> look, here's the valuation. So you have at a $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, $600,000 valuation, and then how much is committed in that area. So that's that histogram I wanted to make of investors and non-accredited investors and showing, hey, how much people would commit. Um, and that's pretty interesting. If we can just get 100,000 committed per company, that'd be very be really cool. awesome. I think we might want to mix the numbers just to see know, both. Or yeah. maybe one histogram, actually, guys, one histogram with both numbers on it, just two different colors, right? So see what green is. is like accredited and blue is launch dollars. Okay. Does that make sense, guys, on the it histogram? Does. Instead of separating it? Because people don't want to yeah. hit. So instead of that toggle here, um, where you say investors, non-investors, I would just get rid of that and just say accredited uh, and then launch dollars. You know, yeah, or accredited. You know. And one is green and one is blue. blue. That would make it easy. Green is real money. Blue is the launch dollars. Launch dollars. Perfect. Uh, what are the next steps? We, you guys are going to send me a test flight I see, and then I'm going to play with it and then tell you what I think? Exactly. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> That's what we're going to do. And I think, uh, you know, as part of the next sprint, uh, we still have a few features uh, that needs to be ironed out, um, such as the event floor plans and, uh, you know, the about us section and so on. Um, so uh, I think it's going to be a pretty pretty busy week or, 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 you know, pretty busy next two weeks. A lot of action happening because everything that we have been doing so far in the past few weeks, it's all just going to come to a close end, um, you know, in the days after the App Store release. So, um, this is going to be awesome. And we have to get this. Well, we have some friends at Apple, if we guess if we needed to email them. But we, we are going to try to get this out 10 days before so that we don't have a problem. Sure. 
All right, 30 days and counting, which means 20 days and counting. This is going to be epic. Uh, you guys have done a great job. I'm very proud to have SourceBits as a uh, partner on this. What an amazing job you guys have done. Everybody follow at SourceBits. Uh, everybody say thank you to at SourceBits. And um, really, I have to tell you, if you're building something uh, for mobile especially, mobile app, your journey begins with source bits, and it ends with them. These guys and gals over there are fantastic. These people over there are fantastic. Um, the process has been delightful. The wireframes, everything, very professional. And just they brought a lot of ideas to the table as well. They listened. It's just very, I also found it very efficient. And just that to me, like, a lot of times I work with folks. Like, I'm going to show some of my internal people how you guys work and say, like, this, this is how I want stuff presented from now on. Just right. a clean, organized go. And you've had this feeling the whole way through. It's not like... I felt great. I mean, I don't want to stump for the guys too much and, you know, make you feel like, oh, you know, uh, I'm making this stuff up. This has been a delightful process. These guys... And you know what? We've had four or five people I know who watch the show use them, and they've had a great experience. So I'm just very uh, delighted to have you guys as a partner. It makes my job easy. As you guys know who listen to the program, to our regular audience... We pick our partners based on the quality of them. We would have no partners on the show if we didn't believe we could stand by them. And that's the biggest... Um, Indeed. That's the biggest... Uh, well, that's just... <clears throat> that's just being true baller style. Like, I can just not have ads on the program, not have partners at any of the things I do. I can just do it, and I was doing it. So when you see somebody who's a partner, you know you can trust J-Cow. Because I'm not going to... I'm not going to accept an e-cigarette company to be a partner of ours. Not a chance. Or somebody who does bad work. We're trying to level up here and do great work on the program. That's right, Karen, you're doing a good job. Thank so, you. But getting up there was, I think, key for you, right? Just huge. I mean, it's such a difference to talk to people yeah. in person. And I mean, I walked around a couple of co-working spaces good. and a hardware place, and that was actually really awesome. You got to get back there next week. All right. Your well, husband's going to hate me. Well, you know, it's only for a couple more weeks. Okay, good, good. Well, if, uh, yeah, you should just go up there and spend a, spend a week up there with you. Tell him to go up with you, right? There's enough room. Maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe you just... Maybe it's good to get a little break and just no, get some never. work done. No, never. I actually was incredibly productive up there. <laughs> I know. It must be. Just get out of the office and stuff yep. like that. And the launch ticker is doing great, even though you're not uh, you know, on the day-to-day -day of it for this week, where I assume you're... I tried to train folks well. Yeah. So. All right. We'll see everybody next time. Thank you, SourceBits, and thank you, New thank Relic. You, see you next time. Thank you. Cheers.